Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. First, a little bit of technical business. I have to apologize for the squeaky desk chair that has been dogging me for these past few, like, I don't know, months, years, God knows what. I finally went out and got myself some WD-40, and I've been lubricating, and it seems to be working. I mean, you know, there's it's not going to be perfect, but it's it's a lot better than what it was. So hopefully that problem has been resolved. Now to business, the Mendelssohn Great Edition. Here it is, 40 CDs from Warner. Wow, baby. It's really cool that they would do this because Mendelssohn, I think, is still one of the most misunderstood and least appreciated of all the major composers. There are a lot of technical and political and historical reasons for that, which we don't need to go into because we've talked about them elsewhere. Suffice it to say that a 40-disc Mendelssohn edition is a big deal. So the question is, should you get this? Well, we'll get into that when we go through what's in it and how it's put together. But I have to say, I learned Mendelssohn, you know, about Mendelssohn and how wrong I was in my assessment of his oeuvre um, by writing a book about it. It's the best way to learn a composer. Here it is, listening to Mendelssohn. And so if you're interested in getting a handle on Mendelssohn in a wider sense, I recommend my book very highly. I mean, no one else is going to, so I might as well. So there we go. I did that plug. Now let's get to this, this 40 discs of stuff. Uh, Mendelssohn wrote a ton of music. He actually published only a tiny fraction of what he composed, but he was one of the most hyper-organized human beings that ever lived. Everything he ever wrote from his childish exercises was kept in a series of bound volumes of calligraphic neatness. Um, and so it's all available, including all of his revisions and everything, everything he had to do with anything. Uh, really kind of remarkable, actually. Um, he was a phenomenon in every sense of the word. And he's a classic case of a composer who burned himself out. I mean, he had so many different abilities in so many different directions and was constantly operating at, at high voltage. And it's not surprising that he just finally sort of dropped dead um, at, at quite a young age. He was, what, 40-something um, in his early 40s uh, when he died? Well, I don't even know. I should know, but dates, I just... And I'm a historian, right? Dates, that never appealed to me. So anyway, um, you get in this box of stuff. Here's the box. It opens like that. You know, the usual kind of flimsy thing because it's budget priced. Um, you get a little booklet. The little booklet has um, a list at the end um, and a little, uh, you know, little essay. You get the complete list of works. There's an index and what volume you can find the work on, which is convenient, um, but it's actually uh, not helpful for telling you what's on the individual discs and how the thing is organized. So let's let's go through this whole uh, thing and uh, you'll see what we've got. I mean, there's a lot of stuff and I can't read off every tiny little thing. There was a creak. There we go. It stopped creaking. We have to lubricate. We have to keep lubricating. Um, anyway, don't go there. So, we begin with instrumental music piano. Let's take out a pile of these things. Let's see, we get to chamber music. Let's start with, okay. Oh, this is exciting. Yes, okay. We have, okay, five discs of piano music. Now, the piano music is going to be dominated, of course, by the songs without words. And in this case, EMI, then EMI, now Warner, had a complete set of the songs without words. I mean, they're not uh, complete songs without word. words. Recordings have only taken off in the past few years. There were traditionally sort of like three complete sets of them. Lots of people did bits of them all over the place, you know, as encores do. But essentially there was Livia Rev on Hyperion, Baron Boim on Deutsche Grammophon, who's the one everyone talks about, and this set by Daniel Adni, the Israeli pianist, and it's quite lovely. Um, it, it's a little bit on the slow side, at least compared to Rev and Baron Boim. It's, it's gentle, um, but also very nuanced and, and, and quite beautiful in places. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Let's put it that way. You're not, gonna, you're not going to be uh, disappointed unless you are a hardcore songs without wordist who has very, very strong ideas about how they should go. 
Um, and then he's got, let's see, what else have we got? We have the uh, Rondo Capriccioso with Samson Francois and the, oh, I, I, we've got, I can't go through all this stuff. I mean, it's going to take forever. Then we've got like other piano music by Alexander Serdar, Helmut Roloff, and Dumin Kim, people you may or may not have heard of. There's a lot of other piano music, very interesting piano music. You've got the, the Fantasy in F-sharp minor, also known as the Scotch Sonata, the Sonata Ecossaise, and you've got the Three three Fantasies or Caprices, Six Children's Pieces. I mean, they're, they're lovely works. They're fun to listen to. They really are. Mendelssohn, remember, was kind of high-strung and neurotic, and so his music tends to be fast. Even his slow music is fast. It tends to be quicksilver, um, not just his scherzos. So uh, you, don't, you don't get bored while you're listening to it. Then we've got, let's see, oh, Annie Darko. Well, that's interesting. Annie Darko is a fine French pianist who I just talked about because when I was at the inaugural playing in the inaugural concert of the Johns Hopkins Symphony Orchestra, she came um, very graciously because she was a friend of a friend who supported the orchestra um, and agreed to perform, I'm sure for nothing, um, or for a private contribution, Beethoven's Third Piano Concerto with us. And she was lovely, absolutely lovely. So I like her. I like her. She's a good pianist, too, so that's nice. And we've got, let's see, uh, the first piano sonata with, with uh, let's use this with Sylvia Kersenbaum, and she knows how to play for sure. Uh, then we've got Daniel Adney is back. <clears throat> yes, for the Six Preludes and Fugues, Opus 35. This is fabulous. This is one of the great Bach knockoffs. You know, I mean, he's obviously, you know, basing, basing his stuff on the well-tempered clavier. But the musical style, of course, is quite different. And the first prelude and fugue, number one in E minor is just, well, E minor is Mendelssohn's special minor key, right? The violin concerto and stuff, you know? It's a knockout. Oh, my God, what a glorious piece of music that is. It's absolutely phenomenal. And then the three etudes, opus 104b, and bits of A Midsummer Night's Dream with Martha Argerich and Christina Martin. In that little piece, well, there you go. There's there's something kind of special. So that's the piano music. It's all, it's all fine. It really is. Uh, then we've got three discs of organ music. Now, Mendelssohn's organ music is basically, for those of you who know it at all, um, the organ sonatas, which are masterpieces. They are the great organ works between the Baroque period and the later French Romantics. <clears throat> you know, the Vidors and, and Guillemont and, and Vierne and those people, and Franck, of course. So uh, they're great. They're absolutely great. If you don't know them, you really should listen to them. They, they might make you like organ music. They're really beautiful. Then there's a zillion small organ works. There's three chorale variations after Vigros ist des Allmächtigen Güte. Yeah, there's that. Um, we've got mostly, mostly uh, Marie-Claire Alain doing the organ music. And you're not going to get better than that. I mean, Wayne Marshall is here. Olivier Latry is here. Noel Rothstein is here. All wonderful organists doing the little pieces. The sonatas are Marie-Claire Alain. And uh, it's they're terrific. It's three really fine discs and many discoveries. Discoveries that you may well enjoy. Then we've got to do the chamber music. Now, the chamber music is CDs 9 through 15. Okay, let me find a place to put these where we're not going to have a, a catastrophe. There's a lot of chamber music, a lot of, and it's really good. Most of it, you, know, like, you see with Mendelssohn, he wrote it when he was 12, but it doesn't matter because he was like Mozart. I mean, he was a genius and a prodigy, and, and there's some amazing stuff in here that people don't know. So first, we've got the violin sonata uh, with, with Maxim Vengerov and Alexander Markovich, and then the two cello sonatas, which are masterpieces, with Frédéric Lodéon, who was a great French cellist, and Daria Havora piano. That came from that box of Frédéric Lodéon recordings that one of you asked me to cover. I have it. I don't know if I'll get to it. But um, he's a lesser-known guy who really was a very, very fine musician. And then we have, let's see, the piano trios. Ah, the piano trios are amazing. The first trio, of course, is the most famous one. But the second, which is in C minor, the first is in D minor, um, was no less interesting. Mendelssohn wrote a lot of works in minor keys. His minor key music was not tragic, you know, panting desperation stuff. It's more nervous, agitated, tense stuff, minor key, but it's wonderful music. 
Um, that's with Trio Fontenay, who are quite fine. Then we've got the piano sextet with all kinds of people. Play it fine. Oh, uh, so the, the string quartets. Okay, so the string quartets, we have the Alban Berg Quartet in numbers one and two, because they didn't do all of them, and they should have. They really should have. The string quartets are, again, like the great set of string quartets between Beethoven and Dvorak. I mean, they're, they're phenomenal works, especially the first two, which is why the Alban Berg did them. Just amazingly integrated, based on the late Beethoven string quartets, which Mendelssohn was almost unique in understanding and appreciating. And then we've got the Artemis Quartet doing six. I think they do all the others. Six, which is one of the scariest, most expressionistic pieces you've ever heard in your life. Yeah, they do number three. And then the Cherubini Quartet does number four. And I think that covers us, more or less. Well, let me see. There may be another one. Four pieces for string quartet with the quartet Arad. Um, and and they're, they play fine. Yeah, and the Cherubinis have the rest of them. And that's really, really, they're really good too. So those are fine performances. It's just weird that they, they didn't just have a single quartet cycle to pop out there. I'm, they must have one, I'm sure. Well, I mean, Carabinis did them all, right? So they could have done them all, but it's good to have the Alban Berrigan one and two. They're a big name, right? Then we've got for the octet, the Kreuzberger Quartet mixed with the Ader Quartet. And it's, I mean, the octet is unkillable absolutely unkillable. It works no matter what you do to it. And it's fabulous no matter what you do to it. One of the great works of chamber music in the history of mankind. Oh, and then this is a wonderful disc. I'm so glad it's back. Domus, remember on Virgin Classics originally, I believe, doing the three piano quartets. And these are so much fun. These are just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful pieces. I love them. I've got I, the finale of the second quartet, I think it is, is my, or the third quartet, I don't remember which one, is one of my best ringtones. I mean, I, it, it's the greatest ringtone. Whenever it goes off, everyone looks up and goes, oh, what's that? It's da 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 It's just a fantastic tune. Um, they're great works. And Mendelssohn wrote them when he was like, I don't know, three or something, who knows? He was in the womb. Then we've got, let's see, the two string quintets, terribly underrated. Nobody cares about them. I mean, they don't get performed. I've never seen one live. And they're glorious pieces. Oh, my goodness. They're just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. The Adagio e Lento of the second piano quintet, I mean, second string quintet, is just one of the most beautiful, beautiful, sad, elegiac pieces. It's an incredible piece. And this is very fine performance. It's with Gerard Cosset and the Equator Viotti. They're very good. So then we've got, let's see, what else have we got here? Oh, of, uh, Emmanuel Pahoud and Eric Lesage doing the, the F major violin sonata in the obligatory flute transcription. Uh, let's see, orchestral works. Okay, so we've got orchestral works. Symphonies and concertos, which is going to get us all the way, all right, all the way up to CD 26. Whew. Well, this is where things get complicated, as you might expect. So we have concertos. First, uh, the piano concertos are with Cyprian Katsaros and Court Mazur. Well, those are good performances, aren't they? Cyprian Katsaros is such a wonderful and imaginative pianist. And you get the Capriccio Briant in B minor and the Rondo Briant with John Ogden. Oh, he does the Rondo. That's nice. And Aldo Ciccato. And then we've got, let's see, more, some of these other concertos. The Violin Concerto with Maxim Vengerov in Mazur. Well, that's a wonderful performance. Um, and the Concerto for Piano, Violin, and Strings with Andreas Steyer and Rainer Kussmaul, Rainer Kussmaul and the Concerto Köln in authentic period, sort of, kind of, well, you know how I feel about that. They're good performances. That's what matters. The, the stylistic approach is less important than the musical artistry in evidence. Then we have the Concerto for Piano and Strings in A minor, the Concerto for Violin and Strings in D minor, then the two concert pieces for clarinet and basset horn. Oh, that was interesting. How was the last time you heard those? And they're lovely. They're little tiny three movement concerti. They're adorable. With Cyprian Katsaros, the Franz Liszt Chamber Orchestra under Janos Rala for the for the piano concerto things, and Jean Jacques Kantorov and the Orchestra d'Auvergne, and Sabina Meyer and Wolfgang Meyer and the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields and Kenneth Stiletto. And, you know, it's all good. Uh, symphonies. Okay, here we go. For the symphonies, I'm just going to bop ahead here because it'll make our lives easier, won't it? For the symphonies, we have the Gavandhaus Court Mazur set. Frankly, 
this set has aged. It has really aged. And Warner had so many other options because this Gavond House Court Mazur stuff was all put in a box previously and issued and reissued and re-re-reissued. And they could have been so much more imaginative when it came to the symphonies. I mean, just think. They have Klemperer, Muti, Tenstedt, Harnoncourt, because you've got Teldeck as well. They could have really done something imaginative and they took the easy way out. These aren't bad performances. They're a little drab. They really are. Um, and I, I, I wish they had, I wish they had done better. I really do. I wish they'd done something else. I mean, to make it perkier. And then we have, let's see, the string symphonies. Now the string symphonies are with Concerto Cone and these are fine performances. They're lively and they're fresh and they're very nice. Um, so I have no problem with that. And then we've got, let's see, more string symphonies. Oh, we've got just, just three discs of string symphonies. And then, uh, let's see, a whole crazy collection of stuff. And frankly, well, you're going to hear it more than once, but the Midsummer Night's Dream Overture and the Hebrides are Celebidaki. I mean, really? Do you, I mean, it's, I mean, why? You know, it's just slow and heavy, ponderous and, Fingal's Cave is practically unlistenable. Da 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 da. Bom. <laughs> it's like oh, good grief. And then we've got Muti's overtures and and Harnoncourt doing an overture, the Fair Melusina, and Muti does Calm Sea and Prosperous Voyage, and and then we've got the Ensemble de Paris. Oh no, we've got Moshe Atzman and the New Philharmonia doing Athalie and then Heimkehr aus der Fremde. Um, and let's see, Roy Bloss is with the Ensemble de Paris and John Nelson. I mean, but, you know, this is such a grab bag. I mean, there were better choices for, well, for those two main items, for sure. I mean, if you want to do Celebidaki, do it as an appendix. But at least for A Midsummer Night's Dream, we're going to get it again because we're getting to the vocal works and incidental music. We have vocal and choral works. Wait a minute, we have leader. Wait, wait, wait. Vocal works, operas. Okay, vocal works and incidental music. So what have we got? A Midsummer Night's Dream. All right, so we have a Midsummer Night's Dream, and we get the overture again. Thank God, lasting 11 minutes and 30 seconds rather than 14 minutes. <laughs> I mean, isn't that better? That's so much better. It's squeaking. It's a little squeaking, but it's not terrible. Okay, um, let's see. It's Court Mazur, again, with the Gavond House. It's a nice performance, but oh, they had Klemperer. They had Previns. Previns is gorgeous. One of the best things he did in the Previn box, the big EMI London Symphony box. Um, you know, I, I know they're doing Gavant House in Leipzig because that was Mendelssohn's like hometown team. I get it, but more variety would have been welcome. There are so many other choices, so many. Uh, then we've got Vocal Works operas. Well, here there are not many choices in terms of recordings. These Heinz Wahlberg um, Munich Radio Symphony recordings of Die Biden Pädagogen a Zingspiel in one act. And then we've got Die Heimkehr aus der Fremde, you know, the return from, from abroad, the homecoming from abroad, which is really a beautiful little work, a delightful little work. It's by also Heinz Wahlberg and these performances, the performers are good. Let me see, it's Hannah Schwartz, Helen Donut, Peter Schreier, Fischer D. Scow. I mean, you know, the singing is wonderful. So you're in good shape for those little Zingspiel-y things. He wrote them for private performance in like his living room. I mean, his house had a concert hall in it, naturally. And, um, you know, don't we all? And uh, this is what people did instead of like, you know, watching Chiller Theater on Sunday mornings. You know, they, they did a sing spiel with, a, with, a, with an orchestra and everything. Life was different back then, if you, especially if you were rich. Okay. Then we've got songs with Fisher D. Scow and Savalish. Lovely performances. I mean, Noya Lipa, one of the great romantic leader. I um, mean, there's all kinds of like really lovely pieces that you'll discover with no texts and translations, which makes them even more fun. And then, oh my God, we've got a collection of songs performed by, I mean, some of them are repeated on these two discs of songs, um, but they're by everybody. You ready for this? You, you're going to love this. You've got Victoria de los Angeles, um, Felicity Lott, Carita Matilla, Janet Baker, Anne Murray, Natalie Stutzman, Dietrich Fischer Diskal played at the piano by Savalish, Moore, Barenboim, Parsons, Baldwin, Graham Johnson. And you've also got the Staatskapelle Dresden and Colin Davis doing Infelice based on Metastasio. It's a concert aria. So that's rather nifty. 
Then let's see, we've got more leader and cantatas. Uh, oh, more leader. Let's see what's this, cantatas. Uh, so leader with Barbara Bonney and Thomas Hampson. And then the Hark the, Her oh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, of course. Mendelssohn wrote that, didn't he? And Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. Ooh, I love Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. That's so nifty. This is the Michel Corbeau's performance, which is quite good. Um, you know, Corbeau's did all that Mendelssohn choral music, which we talked about in the Michel Corbeau's box. So if you got the Michel Corbeau's box, you're going to have all the Mendelssohn choral music that he did that's in here. Um, I love Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. It's, it's a wonderful half-hour-long cantata based on a poem by Goethe about the pagans versus the Christians and the pagans win, which is they scare away the Christians. It's, it's adorable. But it, it's musically related to the Scottish symphony, and it's, it's full of wonderful atmosphere and orchestral effects, and it doesn't outstay its welcome for one second. Mendelssohn spent like 20 years revising it, which is unbelievable. Um, and it's glorious, and I wish they'd used Harnoncourt's performance of it. I really do. It's just quirkier, you know? It's, this is very good, but it's it's quirkier. Then we've got, let's see. Um, <clears throat> then we've got, like, songs with, like, orchestra and other things. Good Lord. With with Gilles Cachemai and the Chœur Symphonique et Orchestra de la Fondation Gulbenkian de Lisbon. This is, this is Corbeau's again. That's an easy way to deal with it. And then for the last pile of stuff, it's going to fall over. Wait a minute. We have sacred works and oratorios. And this is a lot of this stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight discs. Now we all know the two oratorios, right? Paulus and, and St. Paul and Elijah. But he wrote cantatas and short choral works, which, you know, some of which are still used quite frequently in, in Lutheran and Protestant church services. The problem with Mendelssohn's liturgical music is that it was too too good for its purpose. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't wake you up or do anything alarming. It it it's it's devotional and very beautiful. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's very beautiful, but you gotta take it in small doses because too much of it can sound bland. It's just the way it is, because you know that's that's what religious music tends to be. Um, you know, unless you're a great composer writing something that people are going to object to for the most part. Remember, Bach's B minor mass was never performed, ever. Bits of it were in other contexts, but as an, an entity, nah, it's a concert work, right? And, you know, same thing with Haydn's masses were done, you know, for the services for which they were intended. And then after that, they became concert works. The greatest liturgical music is essentially concert music because it's either inappropriate or too difficult for the actual liturgy, as often as not unless it's a very splendid liturgical event. So uh, here we have St. Paul. Now the St. Paul recording is Frubeck de Burgos with Hol Helen Donat, Hannes Schwartz, Werner Holweg, and Fischer Tiskel. It's very good. Frubeck was a wonderful choral conductor. Remember he did that great Carmina Barana. He did Fias Atlantida. He really, we need a Frubeck box. Bottom line. Hey Warner, you listening? We need your Frubeck. So, so that St. Paul is as good as any of them. And, you know, the piece itself is kind of a trial. I mean, if you're not into, you know, sort of fake, fake Bach passion type things. But I, I, when I wrote the book over there, the book, I was pleasantly surprised at just how interesting so much of it actually is. It's all about getting to know it and paying attention, right? The more you know it, the more intently you listen, the more you care the more you get out of it. If the composer is a genius and Mendelssohn was a genius, so what are we worrying about, right? And then the Elijah. Well, the Elijah here is James Conlon with the Gersenich Orchestra of Köln. Um, and the soloists are Machiko Obata, Anna Schwanenwilms, uh, Salvatore Champagne, uh, and let's see, Andrew Collis, and Thomas Fleischmann and David Luger, trebles. And I, it's not a bad performance of Elijah, but Elijah... Uh, they've got Frubeck, and I would have picked Frubeck. I really would have. That's a wonderful Elijah. It was really until like that later Bryn Terfel thing showed up on Decca, Frubeck's was kind of the one to have. So, I mean, I, I don't think that was the best choice, frankly. Then you've got a bunch of cantatas um, with Frieder Bernius and Richard Hickox and Janet Baker. Oh, wow, doing V der, v der Hirsch Schreit. Yeah, as, as, you know, as, as Pants the Hearth, which is you know, what that is thing. Remember that thing? 
which we heard in English for 400 anthem versions by various English composers. Um, Pants the Heart, pardon me, not a hearth. A hearth is like, you know, you know what I mean? It's a, a dear thing, right? As Pants the Heart. Um, and then we've got, let's see, a bunch of psalm settings, some of which are gorgeous. And these are the Corbo's recordings. Uh, let's see, more Corbo's recordings, because he did it. So they didn't have much choice. And more Corbo's recordings, and that wraps it up. All the psalms and other liturgical things. Some of these psalm settings are magnificent. They're masterpieces. They really are. Um, and I, I just, you know, wish that uh, people spent more time listening to them. So those are all fine performances. But if you bought the Corbo's box, then you've got most of the choral religious music. You have it. Um, and it's a good chunk of this stuff. So let me see if I can repackage this without without causing a major crisis. So, there we are. Yes, we did it. And so what do we conclude? Well, as a basic box of Mendelssohn, this is really good. It really is. I mean, if you don't have a lot of Mendelssohn, if you want to get it all in one throw, uh, you're not going to you're not going to be disappointed. It's really pretty good stuff. Even the symphonies with Mazur, which, you know, have dated and it sounds a little aged sonically. I mean, they give you a good sense of what the music is. And any sensible Mendelssohn lover is going to have multiple sets of the symphonies anyway. So I don't think you need to worry about that. But as far as the other works and other performances go, you're in really good shape. And I think it's nice to see that this was released at all. I mean, I really do. So I'm, I'm very pleased. You know, Warner is doing these big boxes one big chunk at a time. Um, you know, they had the Dvorak and Bartok. They had the Hungarian soul and the Slavonic soul and, you know, you know, names for things and the complete Debussy and the complete Berlioz. And, you know, these things come and go and they come and go rather quickly. And the packaging is getting cheaper and cheaper as time goes on. And I, I can see it. I can see it happening. So uh, this may become hard to source in short order. I'm telling you now. So if you really think that this is worth having and you don't have these other boxes and collections, by all means, you, you, you can't do wrong. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me and take care.